You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. So part of my saving grace throughout the pandemic has been uh, going paddle boarding down the Salt River. I go like once a week. What's so incredibly magnificent and beautiful about paddle boarding down the Salt River, especially in the morning, is not only are you paddle boarding with wild horses who live out in that area who are drinking from the river, you are also paddle boarding next to herons and egrets and hawks and ravens. This is local Arizona artist Alexandra Bowers. I'm not actually at the Salt River or anywhere a bird could show up as I talk to Alexandra. We're at our exhibition, A Murmuration of Found Feathers in Flight, indoors in a quiet room at the Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum, housed within the Mesa Arts Center. We're surrounded by 804 of her hyper-realistic heat pen drawings on individual wood panels. Each of the drawings are feathers of different bird species. And to create each of these feathers, they're first lightly pencil sketched, then they're wood burn, then it's watercolor, and occasionally it's water soluble wax, and then it's wood burning, watercolor, wood burning back and forth. Alexandra spent 600 hours creating the artwork for the exhibition. And all that work has gone into creating a room that can give people a little bit of that peace and wonder Alexandra's felt paddleboarding with the birds on the river. My hope, which I, I think it's successful, at least for me, is that that peaceful feeling is then in this place, in this space. Alexandra's art has been fixated on feathers now for about four years. I feel like this magnetism towards this nature-based symbol, its beauty just as an object in and of itself. And then this idea that you can stumble upon it running to the grocery store or, you know, on a trail in the middle of nowhere. Of course, you don't have to go to a serene river or nature preserve to find birds and feathers. They're all around us every day. There's something that's super magical about that for me. We just normally don't notice them. Think about it, like on our smartphones, it's like you leave your house, you get into your car, you turn on your music or you turn on the radio. radio Or you're talking, you know, hopefully through the speaker on your phone. And (laughs) we are constantly so plugged in from one space to the next. Giving yourself like five minutes to not be is a gift. She put out a call on social media for people to discover feathers in their own lives, in their own neighborhoods and favorite hikes, and they sent her pictures along with a little story of what the feather discovery meant to them. Through these stories and her own experiences, she and others have come to see birds flying above us and looking down. As a spirit, as a protector, um, seeing a higher vision, observing from the sky, so this idea of seeing the bigger picture. More than 90% of the exhibition's feather drawings are direct recreations of these fan photos. I've had a few people who have messaged me like, oh my God, now I'm seeing feathers everywhere. It's like, well, you know, I guess maybe I did my job. I opened your eyes to something that you weren't looking at before. So in Alexandra's mind, her job isn't most importantly to sell a piece or make someone say, that's pretty. It's, in this case, to make us think more about birds. Her exhibition is a collection of impressive and pretty illustrations, but it's also a reminder to see the world a little differently, to open our eyes to the beauty flying all around us. I hope when you come in and you look at this, it's like, oh yeah, there are herons who live 20 minutes outside of the city. Oh yeah, there are, you know, hawks and owls that swoop in and they they perch on lampposts and stuff in these neighborhoods that we live in, so... Art can shift our minds in surprising ways. It can transport us to a peaceful riverside and awaken us to the beauty of the chirping birds we'd previously tuned out. On this episode of Here Arizona State of the Art series, we explore art's life-giving and healing power and ponder an age-old question. What is the value of art? What's it really worth?
Mesa's Contemporary Arts Museum is architecturally striking. I walk in the front door and walk down a staircase flooded in natural light beside an all-glass wall. Hi, my name's Anthony. Uh, I'm greeted by a friendly attendant and uh, I am a robotic one that automatically scans my face and checks my temperature. But behind all this impressive grandeur is a native Arizonan passionate about her state's art scene. My name's Tiffany Farrell, and chief curator at Mesa Contemporary Arts at the Mesa Art Center. Tiffany and I talked in a conference room near the Feather exhibition, and she said there's a misconception when it comes to art in Arizona. I feel like there's a lot of um, commentary uh, about the arts in Arizona, like, oh, there's no culture here, or, you know, you hear those kind of things, and that's absolutely not true. It's very vibrant. It's very much alive. And Tiffany loves to show off Arizona's talent at the museum. We actually have a dedicated space to Arizona-only artists, and um, artists can actually apply for shows with us. When we talked, all the exhibitions at the museum featured local artists. This isn't always the case, but Tiffany said at least half their exhibitions year-round are from Arizonans. We never run out of artists to show because there's just so many amazing, ta- amazing artists here. It's important, and um, I think it's also part of our not only job, but our mission to really highlight what we have here. We, we not only do established artists, but do emerging artists as well. And sometimes the show here is led to a show somewhere else and gets exposed to maybe somebody from out, outside of the state. When the pandemic hit, Alexandra was living on a converted school bus in Quartzsite, Arizona. Like Tiffany, she's an Arizona native. She grew up in Scottsdale and studied art at ASU early years at ASU, a professor had said something like the percentage of people who graduate with an art degree and actually pursue a career in the arts is so slim. But I remember when I heard that, I thought, well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to be that person. And Alexandra's worked hard at it for years. She worked at a paint and wine bar, showed her art wherever she could across the valley, and started her own craft business. But recently, she's been selling more of her fine art and transitioning to doing that full time. The Mesa Contemporary Art Museum is unusual in that people can actually buy the art they see there. And the artist keeps 75% of the sale. Usually, galleries keep half. And getting the chance to do this feather exhibition at the museum was a huge opportunity for Alexandra. Yeah, so what does a, this, a place like this mean to you? Yeah, it means everything. This establishment, Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum, is phenomenal. And the team here, it, it feels like a family. I feel like I'm literally being supported by family. The beautiful thing about um, you know, seeing Alexandra at that, in that exhibit is remembering that you know years ago, um, I don't know, five-ish or so, she was showing her wood burnings in a um, a shipping container gallery in Roosevelt Row. Lynn Trimble is a local arts journalist who's been following Alexandra's progression for years. Uh, And let's hope five years later, she's having an exhibition uh, at another gallery in another place. You know, she's a smack melon in New York. So watching that growth um, in in the artists in the art scene, because we think of art as like an object and art as people, right? And so to watch them take their journey Lynn, the arts writer, and Tiffany, the museum curator, have a similar goal driving them. It's just trying to amplify uh, the Phoenix art scene, get it on the radar so people can experience it for themselves and have their own, uh, you know, their art, own art adventures. We have a lot of um, artists that are making national and international splash, but a lot of people don't yet know that about Phoenix, right? I don't know that people identify Phoenix as a, an art town. We're known for our weather, hiking, and spring training. But Lynn said over the next five or 10 years, maybe art can start to join that list. Maybe that starts with having all of our citizens, all of our community members, our residents first recognize the importance of arts and culture. Because then I think once you get it, you know, you're kind of proselytizing. You kind of everywhere you go, you're like, hey, you need to come to Phoenix to see X, Y, Z. The Contemporary Art Museum is certainly doing its part in making Phoenix a nationally known arts destination, but the museum is just one relatively small section of the sprawling Mesa Art Center campus. There's four theaters, multiple galleries, gardens, and outdoor spaces, and 14 art studios. People from Mesa and all over Phoenix can use these studios to create their own art and take classes from professional artists. Before COVID, they offered more than 300 classes each year for 3,000 students. They're typically 16 weeks long, and they offer discounts and fee assistance to make them more affordable. 
and they managed to use virtual learning and safety measures to run about half their normal amount of classes during the pandemic. I spoke with Laura Wilde, who oversees these classes, and visited one in particular for military veterans. My fellow Here Arizona producer, Scott Bork, will tell this part of the story. He has a lot of experience reporting on veterans' affairs. Navy veteran Josh Pinkhard likes to lose himself in his work. It's different than anything else you will ever work with. After spending his military career working at a naval hospital in northern Illinois, he decided to come back to Arizona and pursue a career as an artist. His preferred medium? Glass. Um, but I like making things with my hand, and so I kind of ended up this way because it's different, but it's also beautiful, and it's fragile. It's, it's kind of transient, which really appeals to me. He found his second career teaching art to other veterans at the Mesa Art Center. It's a way for vets to reconnect with each other. Um, a lot of people have similar stories to mine that after we... Oh, excuse me, one second. Right now, he's helping 54-year-old Army veteran Mary Frances McBain shape a piece of glass with a blowtorch. It will eventually be an urn for a relative's ashes. It's called a memorial marble because there's ash um, in there uh, from a cousin of mine. Pinkard teaches for, and McBain is a student in, the Mesa Art Center's Arts and Service Program, which provides free art classes to veterans. And we see veterans and service members from all over the valley of all different kinds of skills, um, in that a lot of whom have been with us um, since the program's inception and have moved on to advanced classes. That's Laura Wild, the studio manager. The program has been around since 2017. And Pinkard's glass blowing class is just one of many offered to veterans. They've been forced to adapt their methods due to the pandemic. Yeah, we have arts and service uh, clay for the garden. So that's a four-week online class where each week students are making something that goes in the goes in your garden, and um, all the clay and tools are picked up in advance. We have a contactless pickup system that we developed for students here. And then we Programs have like this have a hidden benefit too. Navigating the Kafkaesque bureaucracy that is federal veteran services is a substantial barrier that keeps a lot of veterans from even accessing those services. This program helps them connect with others who may have had similar issues. If anybody ever has, um, you know, a question or states like, hey, you know, I'm having trouble, you know, finding housing. We've, we've had somebody with that um, specific challenge before that, you know, has just mentioned it we can refer them to this Be Connected program and get them set up with somebody and ensure that, you know, um, that they're being taken care of. Art makes for great therapy, too. It can provide a sense of purpose and agency that many vets say they lose when they leave the service. Because when I came out of the military, I felt like there was nothing left that I could do because being a disabled vet, it's very hard for me to do much with my arms and my legs and back being so bad. Um, so this gave me confidence that there was something I could do still. And that was very eye-opening and wonderful. Here they learn to be creative and expressive after belonging to an institution that openly and actively tries to suppress those traits. The process of art making is inherently um, but critical. And so after several weeks, you know, you see students making these choices in what we call a brave space um, and making their own creative choices. I'm choosing to make this red instead of green. I'm choosing to make a statement with this piece, right? Or I'm choosing to make it 10 times bigger than anybody else, right? Gaining that confidence. McBain is taking great pride and care, creating her memorial marble. That's the darker color that's, um, cooled off a little bit more than the other parts once I put it in. The ash is, um, here I'll show you, is, see the ash in there? It's the dark, the, the little bits of stuff. It'll be a nice gift for her uncle and will hold his son's ashes. He died unexpectedly a couple of years back, about a year and a half ago. It's just a kind of a kindness that I can do. It's a, it was something I learned here in class. It's easy to see how Mesa Art Center has enabled tons of people to do art, from pros like Alexandra to veterans like Mary Francis. And it's easy to see how that's a good thing. But recent research shows that the benefit of art in society could be more explicit, measurable, and important than many people have ever imagined. If Alexandra's Feather Art Exhibition really makes people slow down, unplug, and appreciate nature a little more, could that kind of thing actually make them more healthy? 
I'm Jill Sankey. I'm director of the Center for Arts and Medicine at the University of Florida. But before we dive into Sankey's work, we have to travel across the ocean for a minute. About six years ago, Jill Sankey met Daisy Fancourt, a professor of psychobiology and epidemiology at University College London in the UK with Daniel Richardson. He's the researcher I spoke to in the last episode who found the audience members' hearts beat in time at a live theater performance. Fancourt has studied huge populations of people, separating out those who participate in cultural activities, going to museums, galleries, and theaters, and measuring how those things impact their health and well-being. And she's found, as Dr. Richardson told me, that these arts activities... The benefits of that psychologically and mentally, um, you know, they're as good as taking Prozac. No, that, that's not sort of hand wavy. It's good for the soul. It's really practically good at you, and we can measure that in a very sort of medical epidemiological way. And it's it's very tangible. The British researchers controlled for all other variables and found that people who regularly participate in the arts are more likely to have high self esteem, less likely to be depressed, and less likely to suffer dementia, chronic pain, and frailty as they age. Now, if you're skeptical, consider this. Fancourt's research has been so convincing that doctors in the UK have started prescribing arts and social activities to patients as medicine, and it's paid off. She said that for every $1 the healthcare system spends on programs to match patients with these activities, they save $4. Imagine, someone shows up at the doctor's office with anxiety and insomnia, and at the root of their problems is loneliness and depression. Sure, maybe some drug could help, but so too could a prescription for an art class. With the class comes a sense of purpose and new friends and less medications and trips to the doctor. So now in Florida, Sankey, a former professional dancer finishing her PhD in arts and public health, is working with Daisy Fancourt to replicate her UK findings in the US. And we're hoping that we can see things like, for instance, you know, older adults who do creative things, whether it's you know knitting, singing with friends, woodworking, um, gardening, attending concerts, going to museums, um, singing in a church choir. Folks who participate in those sorts of activities regularly will have um, things like Daisy has found, for instance, lower incidences of depression or age-related disability. Um, they'll have cognitive improvements. Um, things like that. So we're, we're really looking forward to, to seeing what the United States data will reveal. So could your United Healthcare or Medicare plan actually pay for your museum tickets or music class someday? It's not as far-fetched as it might sound. The American healthcare system has already started doing things like paying for housing and food. Sankey's research could show them that paying for art is a good investment. But she said that art is different in the U.S. in some key ways. I think compared to some other parts of the world, we have a more hierarchical in or out, you know, view of the arts. And for that reason, um, we stop, you know, we stop singing, we stop dancing, we stop doing creative things because we feel that we're not good enough at it. In Daisy's work, she's done a really beautiful job of of articulating the ways in which the arts are a multimodal activity. Um, they uniquely provide a range of benefits at the same time. They provide physical benefits, emotional benefits, cognitive and psychological benefits, social benefits, all at the same time. So they're uniquely powerful, I think, in providing health benefits. Daisy Fancourt is on maternity leave, so I couldn't talk to her directly, but here she is in a 2020 interview with the Serious Science YouTube channel. There have been debates for centuries about whether art has any particular purpose within our society. There have been these arguments that art is just for art's sake and should just be enjoyed as a pleasurable aesthetic experience. Well, the arts certainly are enjoyable just for their own sake, and we should make sure that we keep engaging for the pure pleasure of it as well. But it's actually really promising and comforting to know that the very things in our lives that we can find so pleasurable, like arts engagement, can also be having these short and long-term benefits for our health. I think this gets to the heart of her and Sankey's research and also the heart of what we explore in this podcast. Is art merely a nice add-on, luxury or pastime? Or is it truly valuable and maybe essential for a thriving and healthy life in society? 
On the second episode of State of the Arts, we learned that the state of Arizona dedicates less than one-fifth of 1% 1 of its budget to the arts. So here, it falls on nonprofits and local governments to pick up the slack. In the late 90s, the people of Mesa voted on a 0.5% sales tax increase to fund public safety, parks, libraries, and arts. That half a penny tax allowed them to build the $100 million Mesa Arts Center, and city taxes still support the center today. So even as hundreds of museums, theaters, music halls, and other nonprofit and for-profit arts organizations across the U.S. face shutting down for good due to the pandemic, the Mesa Arts Center is safe. The Phoenix Center for the Arts has a different story. It started in 1975 and was operated by the city until 2011 when it was slated to close down due to city budget cuts. The community really fought to have the center open uh, because it was, you know, very significant for the surrounding neighborhoods. Rene Aguilar is the marketing manager at the Phoenix Center for the Arts. It didn't close in 2011, and since then, it's been supported by a nonprofit. The nonprofit, uh, Central Arts Alliance, you know, they work really hard. The board um, <laughs> works really hard, and uh, we do outreach into the community. Um, we're, you know, applying for grants. That That's what really helps us to keep us going um, without the support of the city. They don't have a $100 million campus, but they are housed in a historic church building near Hans Park, and the city of Phoenix does help them with maintenance on that building. They have an art gallery, small theater, and other spaces other arts nonprofits can affordably rent out. And like Mesa Art Center, their classes are really popular. I asked Renee how many they offer. Pre-COVID, it was hundreds. <laughs> we were actually running out of room and space trying to figure out how to meet the demand because um, our students were um, so enthusiastic about our classes and coming. She said if the center had a bigger budget, it'd expand and update its space to make it more state-of-the-art and build an outdoor theater. But it does offer a lot to the community. And during COVID, it's continued offering limited in-person classes and some online, including one that brings all this arts and health research to mind. One of the programs that we offer, it's called With Art in Mind. And it works specifically with people who are living with Alzheimer's or dementia. And it uses art to really work with their, uh, their memory with um, either movement or music. Jay Alderson and his wife, Anne, are dedicated students of these Dance for People with Dementia classes. Anne was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2012. Jay says the complex dance movements are good for her brain. The tricky part for somebody with Alzheimer's is when you try to put two moves together, like a hand move with a foot move. So it's, it's good for Anne to try to do that. Jay and Ann met when they were seventh graders in Fort Huachuca near Sierra Vista, Arizona. They were fast friends, but didn't start dating until college, and they've been together ever since. Ann is doing well for someone who's had the disease for so long, and Jay is a dedicated caregiver, keeping her company and helping her with difficult tasks, like when I ask her to introduce herself and say her age over Zoom. Okay, tell him your name. Say, I'm Ann Alderson. I'm Ann Alderson. I'm 81 years old. Uh, 81. Yeah. <laughs> 81 years old. <laughs> Ooh. You look great, though. You look great. Oh, thank you. The Alzheimer's Association found that in 2020, 41,000 more people with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia died in the U.S. compared to an average year. Side note, dementia is a broad term for decline in cognitive function that prevents someone from doing their daily activities. Alzheimer's is one form of dementia. And COVID has been so hard for people with dementia because it's harder for them to identify and describe symptoms if they get sick, and it's been harder for them to access their caregivers during the pandemic. But Anne has Jay, and the two of them have been happily hunkered down in their house the past year. We hardly go anywhere, and that's okay. We don't mind. Mm. So we're not going nuts from cabin fever or anything. <laughs> the virtual arts classes give them something to do. The Phoenix Center for the Arts dance class is done through a partnership with Banner Alzheimer's Institute. They help coordinate and fund arts classes for people with dementia at the Musical Instrument Museum, the Phoenix Art Museum, and the Mesa Arts Center. There's a lot to choose from. We could, if we wanted to, go to four classes a week, all online. 
Jay and Anne have been doing the classes since 2013, almost since Banner Health started them. I asked Anne what they mean to her. It was wonderful. It really was helpful to, to know that you have things you can do to feel good about. and. Yeah, good to know you can still do things and feel good about it. Yeah. When people have a problem, they it makes them feel good to associate with other people who have the same problem. And um, for, along with everything else, that's what these classes do, is people with dementia of some kind get to associate with other people who have the same problem. Yeah. And the caregivers are the same way. Jay and Ann enjoy the classes, but is there any evidence that it helps with her health? An unlikely pair on the other side of the country are trying to answer that question. Christina Hugenschmidt is a neuroscientist. Christina Soriano is a choreographer and dancer. They're both researchers at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. One way you can distinguish the two. Brain Christina, body Christina. For years, Soriano's taught improvisational dance to people living with Parkinson's, and Hugenschmidt studied the aging brain and exercise. They met at a conference and together made a powerful realization. Improvisational art is spontaneous. It does not rely on memorization, and so it might be great for people with dementia. And literally, we had this sort of like, you know, brain exploding moment of, wow, yeah. Soriano said she can see an undeniable difference between when people walk into her class and when they walk out with confidence. You know something has changed in that body. And so for Christina, it's also, well, if it's changed in the body, I believe it has changed in the brain as well. So I want to figure out what that what is that change and how can we measure it? The Christina duo is currently running a study to do just this. Put adults with dementia through social dance classes and measure how it changes their physical body. They're checking their balance with scales, their stress levels with blood work, and of course, their brains. Christina Hugenschmidt, the neuroscientist, explained to me that Alzheimer's is essentially the result of a buildup of proteins in the brain that, to use a non-scientific phrase, clog it up. The social dance classes they are studying won't clear these proteins out. No medicine can do that yet, but they could teach the brain to rewire itself around them. In her words, But even if you can't directly impact the pathology, you can still have benefits on the brain by using synaptic plasticity to kind of move around that and to use the parts of the brain that are still working. And in fact, the preliminary results of their studies show just this, that the activities are causing the brain to rewire and work despite its disease. And this research is important because there isn't a lot like it out there. There's been pushback from certain parts of the scientific community saying things like, well, there's no strong evidence that arts have physical effects. Well, there isn't, but that's in part because there hasn't been any money allocated to study it. Brain Christina and Body Christina, the scientist-artist duo, they're a pretty rare thing. Soriano said that in our country, artists and scientists are oftentimes in separate worlds. There are so many artists who are so interested in working more with scientists, and there's just not clear mechanisms to do that well. Part of my investment in this research is also helping artists and scientists recognize that, like, it's not a bad thing that we speak different languages. In fact, it's it's the strength of the work. Ultimately, though, the Christinas have a similar goal as Jill Sankey. Catch the U.S. up to the U.K. when it comes to arts and health. Yeah, the U.K. is far more ahead, as is many parts of Europe. But I would just say publicly, how amazing would it be if someday... An older adult is visiting their physician, and that physician is able to prescribe movement classes, and health insurance companies would support that. Um, Medicare would support that, right? If we can be part of that solution, um, it's a win for artists and scientists everywhere. Until the Christinas and others, research gives a scientific proof that classes like the ones Anne takes are beneficial we we'll rely on anecdotes and testimonials. And one person with a lot of anecdotes is Heather Mulder. It's unbelievable. It's, it's like, you know, music is not touched by dementia. That area of your brain that holds musical memory hangs on well into the progression of the disease. Heather has studied music in college, but she's worked with programs for elderly people for 15 years. She's the associate director of the Banner Alzheimer's Institute's classes program. They do painting, dance, music, ceramics. 
with our, our making programs, you could see people with dementia be able to express themselves in, in ways that they're not able to do verbally anymore. Especially something like music, you can just see with people with dementia that connects to them. And the music brings back memories. You can use it as reminiscence, of course. You know, singing songs about, this one, there was something, a song about tulips, I think, that we sang a couple weeks ago. And people just shared all these rich memories about going to prom. Heather knows Anne and Jay well. Jay told me that Anne loves Baroque music, like Bach, but more surprisingly... Anne also likes electronic dance music because of the energy. Oh, wow. There's a DJ named Armin van Buren. Yes! Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. There's a song that her, the one that he always plays for her is called Blah, Blah, Blah. And she even has the t shirt for it. She showed it to us one time. Heather said the classes aren't going to cure Alzheimer's. Nothing can, but they make people happier. And that's as valuable as anything. These are quality of life programs, and there can't be enough said about the importance of having programs that offer a space for someone with one of these diseases to express themselves in a space that accepts them for who they are. What are the arts good for? How can they make us healthier? Should we pay more taxes to support local artists and fund classes? Should we donate money to arts nonprofits? Should health insurance fund arts classes? Should we brag about our art scene as much as we do about our sports teams? These are difficult and personal questions, and many people we heard from on this episode are working them out now. But for Anne, it's not that complicated. What is your favorite art? Um, dancing, uh, ceramics, or painting? What are, what's your favorite to do? Painting. Why is that? Why do you like painting? Oh, I think it's because um, I can do what I want. Um, I had a hard time sometimes with uh, keeping up, but um, I enjoyed everything that I got to do there. That's great. Yeah, so how, how do you feel when you're painting? Oh, happy. <laughs> You just listened to an entire podcast episode on the arts. So obviously this issue carries some weight for you. To learn more about the organizations we profiled and the issues they face, visit our website, hearearizona.org. That's H-E-A-R Arizona. Tell all your friends to check us out too. They can search for Hear Arizona on their favorite podcast listening app. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, Spotify, And since we're all about empowering our community, we want you to be a part of the conversation. Follow Here Arizona on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast series is made possible by a grant from the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Here Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. Special thanks to the Mesa Arts Center, Alexander Bowers, the Phoenix Center for the Arts, and the Banner Alzheimer's Institute for their help with this episode. The music in this episode was by me and other local artists, Bob Rabbit, Towers, and Brett Ortiz. This episode was produced, written, directed, and hosted by me, Anthony Wallace. Linda Pastore is our executive producer. Hi, this is Scott Bork from Here Arizona Podcasts. Since you're still listening, you're obviously a fan of ours. We want to hear more from you. Visit hearearizona.org and take our listener survey. That's H-E-A-R-Arizona.org. Thanks for listening.